Hi everyone, this is Chemistry at Glance and my name is Aneta. If you're new to my channel, visit my blog and about sections about me to know something more. And today we're going to practice some past paper questions on isomerism and properties of organic compounds. If you're not familiar with the topic or you don't think you're ready for past paper questions yet, uh, remember you can always visit my blog and go through my post on this topic. I leave the links in the description box below. And if you want a, a copy of these questions to go through them with me or you just want to um, put your own piece of paper and do it yourself, but I have the copy of the questions. Uh, so if you want them, just email me, comment, contact me anyway. All the contact details are also in the description box below. And this is our first question for today. So compounds A and B, the A and B, organic compounds or sulfur, found naturally in some foods. These two compounds are structural isomers. State what is meant by the term structural isomer. So structural isomer means that the compounds that have the same MR, so compounds with the same molecular formula, so if you count all the atomic numbers of carbons, oxygens, hydrogens, whatever's in the compound, the, um, the sum of this will be the same for every single isomer. However, what's different is the arrangement of these atoms. So the way they're going to be arranged will be different, but it's going to have the same MR. Okay, part B says, explain why only compound B exists as an EZ isomer. Uh, so it's a carbon-carbon double bond in both of them. But... So there's, sorry, there's restricted rotation in both of them. So we can write restricted rotation because restricted rotation is also a reason for compound B being a EZ isomer. Um, let's start with just saying what an EZ isomer is maybe. EZ isomer means it has at least two functional groups it has two functional groups when in E, the functional groups are on either side of the carbon double bond and in Z, both of the functional groups are on the same side of the E, Z double bond. So what the EZ isomer has to have, the restricted rotatio, rotation, so double bond, which our compound B has and compound A has. But the thing that compound A doesn't have is two different functional groups. It only has CH2S and the rest of them is hydrogens. So it can't exist as an EZ isomer because to, for a compound to exist as an EZ isomer, it has to have two different functional groups. Like this one, it has a sulfur and a methyl groups. So it has two different functional groups. In this example, the two functional groups are on either side of our carbon-carbon double bond. Therefore, it's going to be a E isomer. But we're not asked about this. We just asked why only compound B exists as an EZ isomer. It has a restricted rotation and two different functional groups. Uh, which are attached to carbon-carbon double bond. This is the next part of this question. It's a maths question, which you also can get in the organic chemistry. They can put basically anywhere the maths questions, so just be prepared for this. So compound A is sold by the chemical suppliers at 48 pounds per 100 grams. The material salt is 73% pure, but this is satisfactory for the purposes needed. Calculate the cost of one mole of compound A, which has a molecular formula of C6H10S2. 
So okay, so when I was doing my A-levels and I encountered this question, I found it really, really difficult. I couldn't work it out because the mark scheme didn't really help. It just showed you a very long equation, which had no sense to me. But now I finally got it and I want to help you get it. So um, the first thing what I did was because we are asked to find the cost of one mole of compound A, we have to know what is the mass of one mole of compound A? So uh, we use the equation N equals M over MR because we always use it. So we're trying to find mass. The MR of C6H10S2, you can calculate. I'm sure you know how to do it. Just the ARs of all of these added together. And this gives you 146.3. And the number of moles we're told it's one. So our mass is actually N times MR. Number of moles is one. MR is 146.3. So the mass is 146.3 grams. However, what we also told is the material salt is 73% pure, but this is satisfactory for the purposes needed. So this 146 point, oh, sorry, 146.3 grams is our 73%. For it to be 100%, we can use our cross multiplication. So 100 times 146.3 divided by 73, which is always like this. Times and then divide. Times it and then divide it. And this will give you 200 Point four grams, which will be 100% of the compound A. So we know the mass of compound A in one mole. We also know that 48 pound is for 100 grams. And now we've got to find the price, the cost of this one mole. We know that one mole is 204 grams. This means that we got to do our cross multiplication again. So if, oh sorry, 200.4. So we do times 200 times 4, 200.4 times 48, and then divide by 100. And this gives you 96.2 pound. And this is your answer. I know it looks really difficult when you first look at a question, but when you simplify it and just go back, and do it on your own, you'll get it. Actually, I will show you how I did it. So I wanted to help you answer this question and had to go through all of this to finally get to this. And this is what I told you is in the mark scheme. This is exactly what the mark scheme says. I know this is the EMR, I know this is the price and so on, but I have no idea how they got it. After all these calculations, I finally get it right here at the beginning, at the very end, sorry. But let us get back to our questions. What happens to the boiling point as chain length increases and when branching, branching is added? So you have to divide it into two sections. Firstly, as the chain length increases. So, whenever our chain length increases, boiling point also increases. This is because as the chain is longer, that means there are more and more forces, van der Waal forces, although they're weak, there's going to be more and more of them between the C and H atoms. Furthermore, when um, the chain is longer, it can like go around like this, so it's going to be packed together really, really closely. This is why the boiling point increases, because there are more forces and um, molecules pack closely. As the branching is added, 
there is more branching, the boiling point actually decreases. And this is because when you have this straight chain, which can tangle like this in the spiral, when we have this branching, it's gonna be further away because these branches will mean that the molecules can't pack as closely together because the surface area gonna decrease. This means branching inside the boiling point decreases because molecules can't pack as closely. And the next question. What does this tell you about the number of intermolecular van der Waals forces when the chain branching increases compared to when there is no branching? Uh, so the intermolecular forces, so van der Waals, decrease when branching is present as there's reduced surface area. This means that Okay, so it's going to be easier, I think, to explain it like this. So if we have the branching, so if we have our chain and our branches and here and there, this means um, the molecule will be more compact. Therefore, the surface area will be smaller. And because the surface area will be smaller, there's going to be less vulnerable forces. So the surface area, our answer is because the surface area is decreased, forces are decreased. Don't get me wrong, the branching means the molecules can't pack as closely together because if we, the, the surface area is smaller and they're compact, but when do you want to fit together like this? Our C here connects to another three hydrogens. So if we have another chain, we're going to have it here. And this is the space lost. It's not lost, but there is much more space between these molecules than between two long chain molecules, which can pack really, really closely together. So our surface is... As the surface area in branching is decreased, the forces are decreased. And the next question says, explain why the boiling point of butan one all is higher than that, than that of butan uh, of methanol. This is a very very easy question. The only reason for butan all having a higher boiling point than methanol is because butan one all is a bigger molecule than methanol. Methanol only has one carbon, butanol has four carbons. This means that butanol has more forces, one the world's forces, and because it has more forces, more of these forces has to be broken before uh, butanol will boil. This is the only reason. More forces to break Explain why the solubility of decane and decan one all are quite similar, but those of methane and methanol are very different. So if you imagine you have this very, very, very long chain of decane. I know this is not 10, but just imagine it's 10. And on the very, very last one, you have this alcohol group. So compared to all of these carbons, all of these other nine carbons, the OH group, although it's polar, it's not going to have a big effect on this whole molecules, molecules, because this whole molecule is non-polar and just this bit is polar. And as you know, in water, you can only dissolve polar substances. So decan one all would dissolve. If it wasn't, no, other way. Compounds with alcohols, so OH group, would dissolve in water. However, they wouldn't if they have that many other 
carbons that are no polar, so that that polar bit has less effect due to all these non-polar molecules. In methanol, this is quite different because we only have one carbon. So if we add an OH compared to this methane without an OH, this is non-polar and this OH has a high priority over this non-polar part because it's, it, the molecule is much, much smaller. So this OH will be very, very soluble. This alcohol will be soluble in water due to this polar bond which has a lot of, it's dominant over the whole compound. And this is what I wrote, in decaying one all, the carbon chain has more influence than the OH group. In methanol, the OH group has more influence over the compound than the rest of the chain, therefore it's soluble. And now we've got our drawing questions. So, we're asked to draw and name the structure isomers of C3H7OH. So first of all, just, oh, just draw the formula. So it's C, 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 three Cs, one OH, you can draw it on the first carbon and then just draw the rest of the hydrogens. I'm not going to bother drawing the actually, oh well. Okay, so you got this OH on the first carbon and the rest of them drawn. The next isomer, which you can draw, is for example, moving the OH group to the middle. So this would be prop 1 all and this is prop 2 all. Prop propan. Sorry, <laughs> I've missed an N somehow. This is prop on one all, this is prop on two all. And then after you draw two, you have to think what other you could draw. So you probably think you can draw another one with an OH on this side, but this wouldn't work because it still will be on the first carbon because we can also number the carbons from this side. Okay, so you might think, well, I can do branch in with our CH3 group. Okay, you cannot have this carbon here, you can write it right there, like this. But our longest chain will still be one, two, three. And we're gonna have OH in the middle. So it's gonna be still the same. There's no other isomers that you could do with these, with this um, compound molecule. Okay. Next question says, give the structural isomers of C4H8 and name them. Okay, C4H8. This is our general formula for alkenes, you know, CN, H2N, C4, H2 times 4 is 8. So we know this is an alkene. So the first alkene that comes into your mind with four carbons this is the one at least that comes into my mind, the easiest one, with double double bond on the first carbon. Okay, so you can name it straight away as butene, because we have four carbons. The other one you can do is you can move your carbon carbon double bond to the second carbon, for example. And name it but. 2-in, because it's on the second carbon. Okay, so... What's next? We could actually do even more of these structural isomers for C4H8. It doesn't say how many it wants us to do. In the exam, you'll probably say, like, draw two or draw three. Uh, we're just going to stick to three for now. The other thing you could do is draw the carbon-carbon bond in the same place. However, we can also add a methyl group. Mm. It's 
going to be H here, H here, then our CH3, and then three H's right there. So we have our double double bond, we have CH3, and again, we can name it. So one, two, methyl butene. You still have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hydrogens. We'll still have one, two, three, four carbons. However, we also introduced a methyl group. Next question. There are four isomers of alkene. See, it says it's four. Draw the pair of EZ isomers. So what I always do is I like to draw the compound out first as this plate formula. So it's only one Cl, so the rest of them has to be hydrogens. You don't have to write all the hydrogens down, you can, it's just a sketch for yourself. So we have an R E isomer and a Z isomer. Uh, Z, functional groups are on the same side. E, the functional groups are on either side. Well, actually, I just realized there's four hydrogens and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That means there must be carbon, carbon double bond somewhere. And it's going to have only two hydrogens. So one, two, three, four, five hydrogens. There you go. So as you can see, for E, Z, and Z isomers, we have to have our CC double bond in the middle, in both of them. This means that for this to be an isomer, we have to have two functional groups. One of them is clearly seen as Cl, but we've got three carbons. So our double double bond here, and then another CH3, because we've got C, one H, two Hs, and three Hs. That means you have to have another CH3. So for E, Z, Z, E isomer, they have to be on either side. And for our Z isomer, they are on the same side. And this is what you do. So you draw out the molecule, you put the double double bond, and then see, on this side we've got one, two hydrogens, on this side we have a C and three hydrogens, so CH3 and a CL. So what I did was create, actually not create, but just realize that there are two functional groups which can be put as an EZ isomers. And then the second part of this question is draw and name the two isomers which do not show EZ isomerism. So the other two you can do are C double bond C This one doesn't show EZ isomerism because we don't just have two carbons in the middle and then these bonds that are on the opposite sides, we just draw it out like this. And our second could be this with chlorine not on the end but in the middle like this or uh, and you ask to name it as well so this is going to be chloropropene one two three chloropropene and this is going to be two chloropropene and this was the last question Remember, everything I show you are my techniques and ways of learning and revising. If you have any questions about my videos, please comment or email me. I leave all the links in the description box below. Also, if you have any comments about the quality or content of my videos, please also leave them under this video. Thank you. Um, as you could see, I also make mistakes. I sometimes can't... Um, so anyone can make mistakes. I make mistakes and sometimes I think this way will be easier for you to understand and throughout the question 
I change my mind and then try to explain it again. I know it might be sometimes confusing, but I just try to find the easiest way for you to understand it. I know that I got confused my, when my teachers tried to explain it the long way, so I always, always, always try to make it as short a way, as short as, as possible. Because I know there's already a lot to remember, so why add yourself some work? And for now, like, subscribe, share with your friends, your family, and see you soon. Bye!